Welcome to Arts Express. This is Prairie Miller and on the show. Attention, attention. We interrupt our normal program in the United States is under nuclear attack. Don't worry about yourselves. You'll be okay. Hey, did you see that city where the first atomic bomb was dropped? Yes, Fred. It was a shambles, huh? A shambles? It looked like Ebbets Field after a doubleheader with the Giants. <laughs> well, I guess there's nothing for us to worry about. We're the ones that have the bomb. In the background was the growing struggle between two great powers to shape the post-war world. A Cold War. Enemy aircraft are... And those were scenes from the more relevant than ever classic, The Atomic Cafe, in its 40th anniversary this past year, and in re-release now during the Oppenheimer Mania and this week's Japan Memorial Days, with the atomic bombing of Nagasaki, August 9th. An Arts Express contributor, Lionel Hamanaka, whose parents were imprisoned in one of those U.S. internment camps during World War II, has thoughts to share. But first, in our Arts Express 90-second news from Strange Places about Colin Powell and his notorious capsule of weapons of mass destruction, well, actually not. It was his former chief of staff, Lawrence Wilkerson, who prepared all that for public consumption, but now seems to have had a change of heart to remorse and rage. Here's Wilkerson on RT's Going Underground. We are great at warmongering. We seem to be the most adept country in the world at it, as a matter of fact, which just defies the fact we're supposed to be a democracy and care about things like human rights and such. But in Bush's administration, George W. Bush, I figured that out. By 2004, at least, dumb me, it took a while. We don't give a damn about any of those things. We use those things as sugar coating. We use those things for both international audiences and our own domestic audience as sugar coating. We don't care about freedom. We don't care about democracy. What we care about is power and money, money and power. That sums up America today. And that sums up what our war instrument is for, including nuclear weapons. It's a sad commentary. And Yet, it is a true commentary, and I'll argue with anyone that wants to argue about it till the cows come home that that's our purpose today. War is a profitable business, and we are in profits. That's why we're selling weapons. That's why we're doing what we're doing in Ukraine, and anyone who tries to assign any other reason to it is just simply nuts. That's what's happening. And the sad thing about it is we have now drug uh, essentially 700 million plus Europeans into it who will figure it out sooner or later, and then we're going to have a breach. And let's see the world divided into the European Union, trying to get its political act together, China, the United States, India trying to figure which one to go to at any pivot point and make a quarter of the world's population, if you will, um, and that's going to be it, a multipolar world par excellence, and we're going to be sucking the rear end of that world about 90% of the time if we don't stop and get our act together, not to mention the fact that climate change is going to eat our lunch, it is already eating our lunch. I've just come back from out west. Um, you want to walk down the street where there's nothing but smoke all the time? Ask New Yorkers from the smoke coming down from Canada. Ask people who are looking at water situations that are simply existential for them and fighting with other states out west, trying to figure out who's going to get the water that's left. This is a crisis that if we don't confront right now, this minute, and do it intelligently and competently, forget it. And 
coming up next on the show, Orlando Jones joins us to talk about his latest film, Incidentally Not on Strike by the Unions, Till Death Do Us Part, about a bride played by Natalie Byrne who faces off against a gang of CIA operatives and prevails, likely in no small part back to when she honed her moves as a Ukrainian in the Soviet Union, studying ballet at the Bolshoi Academy. But Jones has much more on his mind as well in a time travel excursion not unconnected to Africa rising at the moment and what went down back then when it all began and how and why he was eliminated from American gods because the gatekeepers accused him of, quote, sending a wrong message to black America. Hello, Orlando Jones here. How are you? Hello, Orlando, and welcome to our show. Thank you for having me. Uh, I see you guys are slumming today. Or what? I was joking. I said, I said, thank you for having me. I see you guys are slumming today. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, in no way. Now, in the credits of Till Death Do Us Part, you're listed as groomsman number four. And without giving too much away, you have to face off in violent combat with a woman. How would you say that's a different experience for you, or perhaps not in certain ways, of getting physically violent against a female on screen? I think it's odd in, in, <laughs> in many ways, uh, to be honest with you. It's, uh, it's sort of wildly out of character, but in the context of a group of, uh, of assassins, of which she is one, um, I also think it, it sort of plays on some of the, the tropes that we often see, right? Um, I wanted to craft, particularly without giving it away, some of the final moments in a way where you find yourself laughing, where you don't expect to be laughing, and then you find yourself going, oh, turning away moments later because you don't expect that to happen either. So I think there's a component to keeping the audience guessing that's important. But I also think, you know, not going into this type of moment where you're gleefully trying to beat a woman to death um, it's, it's an important part of our approach to how we were going to tell this. But it, it, it does feel, at least to me, uh, as, as, as Orlando and not the character, it definitely feels odd. And did you have any personal inhibitions as a man about beating up a woman, even if on screen and not in the real world? I think the character certainly did in his own right, because I think that's part of what, at least for me, that's what I was playing. You know, uh, there's always this this feeling with these types of characters that they're one dimensional and that you know they sh- you know they kill people so they kill people so they must you know, they must enjoy it. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I thought, well, I don't think this guy enjoys it. I think this guy thinks he's more classy. I think this guy thinks he's a bit more elegant. I think he thinks these guys around him are a bit buffoon. And I, I don't think he was expecting what he trans what transpired there to go down. I think he was frankly more focused on his disdain for the best man and the the, you know, insidiousness of the others around him until things sort of turn serious and then suddenly he must turn serious with it. But I always think that there's a, there's a, there's a hesitation, at least to me, because I think you have to be mindful of the fact that, you know, the audience for cinema is largely with And if your approach to, to, you know, a confrontation with a woman is that, ooh, I can't wait because it's fake on screen to, give, to beat a woman to death, I, I just don't know what energy transfers to screen in that case. And I'm not sure what story you're trying to tell. And I'm not sure how I would feel about how that story might resonate uh, with someone. I, that's the part that makes me the most uneasy is that there are individuals who that might resonate with. And I certainly do not want to find myself in a situation where they're slapping me on the back going, man, the way you kicked that woman's butt, that was awesome. You know? <laughs> and that's really the part that bumps me because I'm like, Yeah, we we are not allies, my friend. (laughs) (laughs) And speaking of parting ways, what can you say about what happened to you unjustifiably with the end of your character Anansi on American Gods? I I think the the long and the short of it is that there are gatekeepers who, who are of the impression that they are in charge of what the audience gets to see and and very much the things that you and I were just talking about. And those gatekeepers changed from season to season on American Gods. And by the time we got to season three, that 
the newest gatekeeper uh, had just, without ever speaking to me, had decided that, um, you know, I was not something and the, what I was doing and how it was being received was all wrong. But, uh, I think primarily because it was taking, uh, I think, attention away from the people who he thought were more important than me. <laughs> um, and all of those things, I think, led to, you know, you know, them doing what they did in the way they did it, where, frankly, they were particularly attempting to be nasty towards me. And I think they expected a very different reaction than what they got from me. But at the end of the day, I'm proud of the work, and I'm very much proud of how he was received. Yeah. And I'm, I'm proud of how, you know, the, the writing work and producing work I was able to do and, and to help my castmates realize some their own characters when, when they were often experiencing some of the same stupidity I was, but not at the same level. Um, so I don't regret it at all. It, you know, it's not the first time I've had a, a less than pleasant experience, but I, I am a, I'm a professional and I tend to ignore those experiences more often than not because they, they are the constant, right? Um, and doing the work is really the thing that's important to me and being able to tell my story my way, um, as, that is in a way that is unique to me is, is is part of what's important to me, and so I feel like I accomplished all those things um, despite their attempts to stop me, and uh, I take that victory because <laughs> there were concerted efforts to stop me, but alas, <laughs> I won the war uh, on that one, and um, and hopefully uh, you know audiences enjoyed uh, what that was. What can you say about those culture cops on the show accusing you of, quote, sending a wrong message to Black America? And why did you bring up the name of Denmark Vesey in that regard? Denmark Vesey is a, is a particular uh, person who there's been a concerted attempt to scrub from um, American history. Um, and without Denmark Vesey, there, there would be no Frederick Douglass um, and the abolition of, of slavery and the rights that, uh, that we fight for and the, the soul of black love as it came from Harriet Tubman and others where people love so greatly that they are trying to fight for rights of all people. I don't, I don't think black people have ever said we were fighting for the rights of just us. It's always been the rights of everyone. So talking about those forefathers and foremothers and uh, the work that they did, uh, particularly at a time uh, where people are trying to scrub that from history, I think it's critically important to mention those individuals by name and to juxtapose them against individuals who are specifically trying to do the opposite of that, to, um, to diminish their existence and to also twist their words to make it seem like there was something dirty about wanting um, equity and, and something um, dishonorable about not, um, about not allowing gender to enter into the equity conversation, which is what Denmark and others were about. For me, those people are important. They're the shoulders I stand on. I am a Nina Simone James Baldwin artist, uh, and that is, those are the individuals that inspired me artistically. They, were, they continue to do so, and their legacies are important to me. Um, and because we are in a time now where I believe the structure of master and apprentice is often looked over because everybody thinks they can be a master and they don't need to apprentice, well, I had to apprentice, and I apprenticed at those feet, and so I, I try and mention those yep. those masters that I believe were so critical and crucial and, and helping me develop as a young man and putting ideas in my head that I didn't previously think of. So when leaving the show, I thought the, the stamp that I must leave as Nancy is one that is authentic to the story I've been trying to tell the whole time. And, and that, mention, uh, that mention of Denmark VC was my, my hat tip to that. Yeah. And when Orlando Jones looks in the mirror, what does he see? I see Maddie Jones and John Jones' voice. Um, <laughs> I, I'd like to think um, I'd like to think that I, I see an artist. I think art is about what connects us. I think what I often see is um, my flaws, you know, what I believe to be my flaws, and um, I try and remind myself that I am uh, I am I am perfect as I am, and that I'm enough, and that uh, my failures only pave the way to my successes. And the balance is probably one of the most important aspects of, of life. And, uh, and maintaining that balance in your head is a, a critical balance. And uh, it, it often gets out of balance with so many outside voices coming at us all the time. But 
I think I probably go through all of that every time I look into a mirror. Like, oh, here's what I don't like about you. Uh, here's what you're trying to be. Oh, here are the mistakes you made. You know, I kind of, I feel like I run it all through and, and yeah. try and get myself back to, it's okay. <laughs> you woke up today. Let's try and get it right. <laughs> Put your pity party away. Get to work. And any thoughts about the Hollywood strikes? I mean, I think everybody who follows business knows that it's going to be difficult to get money out of someone when they're in a downturn. Television has always been the advertising business. It remains so. Those who are in an ad-supported model are making money. Those who are in a non-ad-supported model are struggling. However, there is, there is a gatekeeper mentality in Hollywood, and there is an expectation that they're going to fight to try and maintain the control they have. Unfortunately, technology is ahead of them, and there's no way to get that toothpaste back in the tube. So I point to the music industry and say there was a time when you had to go to the record company and get a bank loan in order to be a music artist. And then along came these independent people, and everyone said, oh, they're just going to buy you and gobble you guys up. You're never going to be anybody important. But I humbly submit to you that Drake, Weekend, Nicki Minaj, and Lil Wayne are all independent artists, and they are on an independent label by a guy whose name is Birdman. <laughs> so we clearly see how the independent label situation changed dramatically and took large lion shares of what used to belong to gatekeepers. And I believe you're seeing that, and we'll see that unfold again um, with the smart channels on YouTube and with independent yeah. film. And I think this film that we're discussing is a great example of that. We are entering into the marketplace against Barbie, against Oppenheimer, and these are very big films. Yet there is no doubt in anybody's mind that if what your expectation was walking into Barbie, I mean, that's not the feeling you leave with. And that's not the feeling you often you leave Oppenheimer however, with. So when you look at the times and what's going on in the world and how social media has us all in a cloud chamber and we're all hearing what we want to hear and often no diversity in opinion or voice, this sort of film, which feels like an outlier, suddenly has a huge chance against films that cost a lot more money yeah. and that this is independently made. So I look at this little independent movie and I say to myself, if this is any foreshadowing for what the history of Hollywood is going to be, it's likely that you're going to see more passionate works from artists who love these genres and less manufactured, I'm trying to sell more Barbie toys, because if all the gatekeepers and studios in Hollywood have to say is watch and buy, and they don't build an authentic relationship with their audience, yeah. they're going to be out of step with them forever, and, and that's a problem to their, their bottom lines. Different world. Okay, thank you so much, Orlando, for joining us on the show. Thank you very much for the interview. Uh, hopefully I didn't prattle on too long. And that I was, was able wonderful. To bring up... <laughs> <laughs> I try to actually answer questions when I'm talking to a serious journalist and when I recognize them. <laughs> Normally it's just high energy and stupid questions, but right. when I'm talking to a serious journalist, I'm like, I'm actually going to try and give thoughtful, real answers <laughs> to your questions because she didn't just think of these two seconds ago. <laughs> right. Well, I appreciate <laughs> so that thank so you. much. Thank you. <laughs> Not at all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Until Death Do Us Part is out now in release. And here's some of what Orlando Jones had to say back then about what went down for him on American Gods. American Gods, a fusion of history and mythology as to who or what has ruled over this country for better, but usually much worse. It's one of those elements I will always cherish throughout the course of my career because it's a character I really wanted to play. Those are the rare circumstances where the art form gets to do something good. Orlando Jones a star of the novel to small-screen Neil Gaiman adaptation American Gods got together to talk about immersing himself with such passion into the character of Mr. Nancy, who turns up centuries earlier on a Middle Passage Dutch slave ship to enlighten the terrified captors on board 
of the horrific fate that awaits them actually for centuries to come. Jones relates how profoundly being part of those simultaneously raw and mystical events affected him. First, some scenes from that formidable episode two of American Gods on the slave ship with one shackled, terrified African asking Mr. Nancy how could they free themselves without perishing in the process, and he replies, Anansi. You won't help? Fine. Let me tell you a story. Once upon a time, a man got done. Now, how is that for a story? Because that's the story of black people in America. <laughs> You all don't know you black yet. You think you just people. Let me be the first to tell you that you are all black. The moment these Dutch mothers set foot here and decided they white and you get to be black and that's the nice name they call you. Let me paint a picture of what's waiting for you on the shore. You arrive in America land of opportunity, milk and honey, and guess what? You all get to be slaves, split up, sold off, and worked to death. The lucky ones get Sunday off to sleep and make most slaves and all for what? For cotton, indigo, for a purple shirt. The only good news is the tobacco your grandkids are gonna farm for free is gonna give a load of these white mothers to cancer. And I ain't even started yet. A hundred years later, you're done. A hundred years after that, done. A hundred years after you get free, you still getting done. Out of job and shot at by police. You see what I'm saying? This guy gets it. I like him. He's getting angry. Angry is good. Angry gets. shed tears for Kumbi and Lanze. And here he is telling you, you are staring down the barrel of 300 years of subjugation, racist bull, and heart disease. He is telling you there is one goddamn reason you shouldn't go up there right now. And slit the throats of every last one of these Dutch mothers and set fire to this ship. Mana, go me like a boko. And you need like a wolf. You are already dead, asshole. At least die a sacrifice for something worthwhile. Let the mother f burn. Let it all. you to take on this role with such passion you know it's not every day you get handed a scene on a slave ship so um i uh you know look it's it's a wonderfully written piece and and uh it um uh, it's one of those elements that i think uh i will uh i will always cherish throughout the course of my career because uh, it's a character i really wanted to play but also saying things in the way that i've hoped that they would one day be said you know but not apologetically and not as an accusation but as an invitation into the insanity that it has been and and to uh, 
a conclusion, which is if we're really angry, then we should get it done. Thank you. And incidentally, in an unprecedented reaction, immediately following the filming of the slave ship scene, the cast and crew stood up and applauded. This is Arts Express, and coming up next... Testing the atom bombs was a mistake. There's no second chance to avoid the obliteration of mankind with nuclear weapons as they exist today. Lionel Hamanaka, writer-activist. My parents were in the Jerome, Arkansas concentration camp for Japanese Americans during World War II. I believe the atom bombs set the tone for mankind, hurtling us into the futility of many new wars. And once a war is started, you cannot tell where it will end. War destroys the environment, and we won't be able to save the environment unless we eliminate nuclear weapons. Humans are human, and if the button is pushed to initiate nuclear attack, the human race will become extinct like dinosaurs and there will be no future for our children and grandchildren. Don't worry about yourselves. You'll be okay. Hey, did you see that city where the first atomic bomb was dropped? Yes, Fred. It was a shambles, huh? A shambles? It looked like Ebbets Field after a doubleheader with the Giants. <laughs> Well, I guess there's nothing for us to worry about. We're the ones that have the bomb. Attention, attention. We interrupt our normal program in the United States is under nuclear attack. In the background was the growing struggle between two great powers to shape the post-war world. A Cold War. Enemy aircraft. I think we should use the atomic bomb in Korea. We should destroy them and contaminate them. Now listen, kids. If they're dropping an atomic bomb, we'll wait about a minute after it's all over. Then we'll go upstairs and take a look around. A new housing development near Denver, Colorado, shows the nation's first model homes with built-in fallout shelters. It may be just what the harried housewife is looking for. Hit the drink that you don't pour. Now when you take one sip, you won't need any more. As small as a beetle, as big as a wheel. Boom. Atomic cocktail. You must be ready every day, all the time. First, you duck. duck. Then, you cover. Under the table. Duck. It's a bomb. Duck can cover. This is not a haphazard maneuver. Five, four, three, two, one. And by the way, do you know exactly what your family would do if an attack came? Say at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. It's a good question, isn't it? And now, from our sister station in Baton Rouge, WHYR, on the 225 Theater Collective, Stephanie Bardage. Good evening. Welcome to Arts Express. I am Stephanie Bardage, Artistic Director for 225 Theater Collective, a theater nonprofit on a mission to bring more diversity on stage. We are based out of Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and have been operating for two years now with much success. We have brought many stage productions here to Baton Rouge, and we are excited to bring our next production, The Shawshank Redemption, stage adaptation, to the LSU Studio Theater. It will run August 25th through the 27th. I got the chance to sit down with my cast and talk a little bit about their experience portraying some of these very well-known, well-respected characters from the story of Stephen King. I first have Mr. John, who is portraying Red. How are you today? I'm doing well. Thank you, Stephanie. 
But my question for you, John, is what has been your experience portraying such a big character in this story? Uh, personally, Red has been an absolute favorite of mine for years. It's just his quiet, just demeanor. He's sure of himself and who he is in this story. And everybody loves and respects the great Morgan Freeman. And I'm not trying to copy him, but I'm trying to pay respect and honor to that performance because that's why I'm here. Because that performance that I've been able to just see and take in for 25, almost 30 years now. Uh, and I'm just doing my best during this process just to try to learn to bring my own spin to it while respecting, you know, why I'm here in the first place, and that's because of him. Absolutely, and you're doing a fantastic job at it, by the way. Well, next up, we have Mr. Corey. What's up, what's up, what's up? Oh, I love this energy. <laughs> I need some of that energy. Where was that energy when we were rehearsing? <laughs> it's just coming, it's, it's just, just coming. coming. <laughs> it's delayed. It was, it was, it was, it's the, it's, the, it's the ride. It, it wore me out. You know, it's one of them days, but I'm good. I got this. I was killing. You're good. You're, you're, it wasn't you're... the alcohol we were serving before break. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no alcohol. Um, well, we see a very different character um, in you. You play Rico. And Rico is sort of mysterious to me. Um, yeah. And I think he is going to be um, a mystery box for for the audience as well. I can't really get a, a read on him sometimes. And we we learn that he does have a troubled past. He did do something very horrific to his family, but he is a born again Christian. Right. Um, and I think that is very controversial as well. That topic of you know he did do this horrendous thing, and now he is you know, talking about forgiveness and, and all these different things when it comes, comes to Christianity. And I wanted to ask you specifically, what is your take on that? And how does it feel to portray someone going through those emotions? Excellent question. It's very challenging, you know, because Rico is totally opposite of me. Though what I love the most about the character is that it addresses mental health. Mm -hmm. Mental health is a real thing mm -hmm. these days. And to get into full actor mode and portray something that I haven't ever done before speaks volumes. Right. So when it comes to Christianity, there's a lot of times that folks don't address trauma. Mm. Like folks tend to just push it under the rug. Mm -hmm. And with Rico, it's like he has his moments where he's like, look, I know I have issues, mm -hmm. but I'm still human. Right. So that's what I, I enjoy most about that is yeah. just uh, embracing that empathetic side of Rico. Yeah. And I love that because... I think the audience will appreciate that in many different ways. They can relate to you and not necessarily, you know, the, the religious side, but just like you say, we're all human. We all do make mistakes. And his was, was rather heavy, right? What he yeah. did to his family. But um, the way that he talks about it and the way that he talks about, you know, everything's going to be fine. And he does say that many times in the play, especially to Andy that's going through a tough time. Um, I think that we can relate to you a lot. And Definitely. so I, I really like Rico's character <laughs> because of that. Yeah, he's, he doesn't have a lot of stability. That's for one thing. <laughs> yeah. well, he, and he's also, he also does bring, um, like, like Dawkins, he does bring a lot of comedy to the play yeah, as well when does. it's needed. <laughs> when it's so, needed. And we're going to hear you sing too. Yeah. Are you yeah, excited so, about that? Yeah, the tea is ready. It's brewing. So, you know, <laughs> vocal coach on stage. Stand by. We're going to make it do what it do. <laughs> well, thank you so much, no Corey. Problem. Thank you. Well, next we have Andrew, who is portraying Boggs. And if you're not familiar or if you don't remember, Boggs is one of the sisters who traumatize um, Andy throughout the play. And they're giving each other looks right now as we're, as we're speaking about it. But my, my question to you, and this comes from the character analysis that, that we did I remember something specific you said is that you don't want Box to be characterized as a villain. You do not like that term for him. And that really stuck with me. And I want to ask why. Well, because he's, he's, still, he's still human, um, no matter what. And, and, and that's the one thing about, about uh, everything we do, everything within, within acting and theater and all that. We're portraying humans. And no matter the evil that we do, it's still a choice. And, and Box and I, um, make this choice to to do things to people in order in order for myself. I still have my own my own human emotions. I still have my 
own human needs and I still need something. Mm -hmm. I need this. I need, I need life. I need love. I need connection. And so my choices in order to do that may not be positive, may be negative, but, but, but still a human choice. And so for me, and, and part is also my own, my own personal belief, no one's 100% evil, no one's 100% good. Mm -hmm. We all fall, fall somewhere within the gray area. I like that. I like that response. So can you say that the audience will feel sympathy at all for Boggs at some point I, in, the, in the production? I, I think so. I think that... Uh, I think that at some point he's like I said I, I, I'm 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 portrayed he's still human mm -hmm. and he's still he's still a very tragic character because of his choices and because in my opinion of what he's forced to do. Mm -hmm. Got you. Well, thank you so much. Well, next we have Alden that is portraying Entwistle, one of the guards in the story. My question for you is, what is your favorite scene in the play? My favorite scene in the play. <laughs> uh, and it doesn't have to be one of yours. It can yeah. be, you know. No, nah, there, there's a, I don't know. I have a lot. I have multiple favorite scenes. It's, it's pretty hard. Um, I think, uh, let's see. So one of my favorite scenes is pretty much when uh, Brooke C is on the ladder. That, that's mm -hmm. pretty intense. I do love the intensity of that, just that moment itself. Um, the 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 kind of rush that it brings to the play itself, uh, the fact that everyone is also involved in that moment, and it's just, I mean, it's a big moment in the play because I, I feel like that's when everything makes this big turn, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So I think that would be my favorite scene. Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a great scene for sure. Um, and I think we see you for the first time. We see you really feeling bad for for Brooksy in a different way, mm -hmm. and I love the way that you portray. Ent whistle because it's very different from Hadley, which is the mm -hmm. other guard that is more cold, yeah. cold hearted. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Alden. Well, next we have Skylar. Come on over, Skylar. Who portrays Dawkins? And I really love this character because he brings a lot of comedy to the play when it's very much needed. Um, he does make some snarky remar uh, remarks and just gets the other cons laughing, um, even if it's not such a funny moment. But my question for you is, if you can change anything from this story, what would you change and why? That's a good question. Thank you. Um, I would change, I wouldn't change anything to be honest. I'll keep it, I mean, it's, I think he is, is an amazing, amazing points you catching everything and incorporating it in such a short time and mm -hmm. just it's, it's almost perfect it's, it's almost near perfect the way I got I, I think I wouldn't change nothing to be honest yeah I think we can all agree when we say that um Stephen King is such a I mean genius in writing and this story has touched the hearts of many in, in many different ways. And seeing it now come to the stage is very exciting for the theater community. And I'm just so happy that we can bring it here to Baton Rouge. Tune in next week, August 16th, for part two of the Shawshank Redemption stage adaptation discussion with the cast. If you would like to learn more about 225 Theater Collective, our mission, our upcoming workshops and productions, you can visit 225theatercollective.com, follow us on Instagram and Facebook. Thank you for listening. Arts Express. And we'll go out now with the Arts Express Playhouse. Hi, this is Jack Shalom. This year, Virginia Woolf's groundbreaking experimental novel from 1923 called To the Lighthouse went out of copyright. Well, we grabbed the opportunity to write and produce a radio adaptation of the book that you can hear in full on our Arts Express podcast. But for now, we'd like to bring you a little excerpt from that production and introduce you to why that novel was so special. Virginia Woolf's remarkable novel centers around two women, the first Mrs. Ramsey, a married woman with eight children who treasures nurturing relationships and family, but is bound in a rigid marriage, and the other woman, Lily Briscoe, an artist who has had to navigate her own life completely solo. Now, the book questions the choices that each woman has made. Who has made the right choices? Where does a person's priorities lie? 
and the actual story takes place on two days at the same summer vacation house in England, separated by ten years. And those two days, ten years apart, are tied together by one goal, the goal of a six-year-old boy, James Ramsey, to take a journey to the lighthouse, a stormy boat ride away from their summer vacation home. But between the two attempts, the world has turned upside down from both the First World War and the Spanish flu epidemic. Like today after the COVID pandemic, nothing remained as it was before. Well, this excerpt introduces the Ramsey family early on and highlights the tussle between Mr. Ramsey, the intellectual philosophy professor who cannot quite attain the heights of intellect he wishes he could attain, and Mrs. Ramsey, who wants more than anything else to fulfill her son James's wish to get to the lighthouse. Because the novel was written as a stream of consciousness where the character's outward dialogue and innermost thoughts are freely mingled in the text, our radio version attempts to capture that flavor by having each actor deliver not only their own spoken words out loud, but also to express their thoughts in the third person. Don't worry, you'll soon catch on. So now some early scenes from To the Lighthouse. Are we going to the lighthouse tomorrow? Yes, of course, if it's fine tomorrow. But you'll have to be up with the lark. To her son, James, these words conveyed an extraordinary joy. James Ramsey, sitting on the floor cutting out pictures from the illustrated catalogue of the Army and Navy stores, endowed the picture of a refrigerator, as his mother spoke, with heavenly bliss. It was fringed with joy. But it won't be fine tomorrow. Had there been an axe handy, a poker, or any other weapon that would have gashed a hole in his father's breast and killed him, there and then, James would have seized it. But what Mr. Ramsay said was true. It was always true. He was incapable of untruth. Never tampered with a fact. Never altered a disagreeable word to suit the pleasure or convenience of any mortal being. Least of all, his own children, who sprung from his loins, should be aware from childhood that life is difficult, facts uncompromising. But it may be fine. I expect it will be fine. Mrs. Ramsay made some little twist of the reddish-brown stocking she was knitting impatiently. If she finished it tonight, if they did go to the lighthouse after all, it was to be given to the lighthouse keeper for his little boy, who was threatened with a tuberculous hip, together with a pile of old magazines and some tobacco. Poor James, how would you like to be shut up for a whole month at a time, and possibly more in stormy weather, if you were married, not to see your wife, not to know how your children were, if they were ill, if they had fallen down and broken their legs or arms, to see the same dreary waves breaking week after week, and then a dreadful storm coming, and the whole place rocking, and not be able to put your nose out of doors for fear of being swept into the sea. How would you like that? It's all due west. There'll be no landing at the lighthouse tomorrow. She wished they would both leave her and James alone and go on talking. Mr. Tansy is a sarcastic brute. To be fair for walking up and down, up and down with father, and saying who had won this, who had won that, who was a first-rate man at Latin verses, who was brilliant but I think fundamentally unsound. Now, Andrew, they were so critical, her children. They talked such nonsense. She went from the dining room, holding James by the hand, since he would not go with the others. It seemed to her such nonsense, inventing differences, when people, heaven knows, were different enough without that. The real differences are enough, quite enough. Rich and poor, high and low, the things she saw with her own eyes, weekly, daily, here or in London, when she visited this widow, 
or that struggling wife in person with a bag on her arm. Insoluble questions they were, it seemed to her. And even if it isn't fine tomorrow, James, it will be another day. And now, stand up and let me measure your leg. My dear, stand still. How could I see if it was too long or if it was too short? Stand still. Don't be tiresome. It's too short. Ever so much too short. Let us find another picture to cut out. At the window, Mr. Ramsay bent quizzically and whimsically to tickle James's bare calf with a sprig of something. James will have to write his dissertation one of these days. Hating his father, James brushed away the tickling spray with which Mr. Ramsay teased his youngest son's bare leg. I am trying to get these tiresome stockings finished to send to Sawley's little boy tomorrow. There isn't the slightest possible chance that we could go to the lighthouse tomorrow. How do you know? The wind often changed. Damn you! Not with the barometer falling and the wind due west. I'll, I'll step over and ask the coast guards if you like. I am quite ready to take your word for it. Only then they need not cut sandwiches. That was all. It, it won't rain. Someone had blundered. And off he went again, striding off up and down the terrace. Someone had blundered. Mr. Ramsay looked at his wife and son in the window. They fortified him, and he concentrated his effort to arrive at a perfectly clear understanding of the problem which now engaged the energies of his splendid mind. And it was a splendid mind. For if thought is like the keyboard of a piano, divided into so many notes, or like the alphabet is ranged in 26 letters, all in order from A to Z, then his splendid mind had no sort of difficulty in running over those letters one by one, firmly and accurately, until it had reached, say, the letter Q. He reached Q. Very few people in the whole of England ever reach Q. But after Q, what comes next? After Q, there are a number of letters, the last of which is scarcely visible to mortal eyes, but glimmers red in the distance. Said is only reached by one man in a generation. Still, if he could reach R, it would be something. Here, at least, was Q. Q he was sure of. Q he could demonstrate. Then, ah, oh, he braced himself. He, Clenched himself. Ah, oh, is then. What is ah? Oh, a shatter, like the leaden eyelid of a lizard, flickered over the intensity of his gaze and obscured the letter R. In that flash of darkness, he heard people saying, "He." was a failure, that R was beyond him. He would never reach R. On to R. What's more, R. He stood stock still by the urn with the geranium flowing over it. How many men in a thousand million, he asked himself, Reach Z after all. And his fame lasts how long? Who then could 
blame the leader of that forlorn party if before death stiffens his limbs, he does a little consciously raise his numbed fingers to his brow and squares his shoulders, so that when the search party comes, they will find him dead at his post, the fine figure of a soldier. Mr. Ramsay squared his shoulders and stood very upright by the urn. But his son hated him. He hated him for coming up to them, for stopping and looking down on them. He hated him for interrupting them. But most of all, he hated the twang and twitter of his father's emotion, which, vibrating around them, disturbed the perfect simplicity and good sense of his relations with his mother. Nothing would make Mr. Ramsay move on. There he stood, demanding sympathy. I'm a failure. I'm a failure. Charles Tansley thinks you the greatest metaphysician of the time. I am, am a failure. Well, look then. Peel then. If you put implicit faith in me, nothing should hurt you. However deep you buried yourself or climbed high, not for a second should you find yourself without me. I'll take a turn. I watch the children playing cricket. The father of eight children has no choice. And you've been listening to a piece of our full-length radio production of Virginia Woolf's To the Lighthouse. In the cast, you heard Byron O'Hanlon as James Ramsey, Mary Murphy as Mrs. Ramsey, Joe Levine as Mr. Tansley, Keyshawn Lucky as Andrew Ramsey, and myself as Mr. Ramsey. You can hear the entire production at our Arts Express Pod Bean page at the following website, artsexpress.podbean, that's P-O-D-B-E-A-N, dot com. This is Jack Shalom for Arts Express with host Prairie Miller. And that's all we have time for today on Arts Express, expression in the arts. And if you'd like to express yourself too, you can write to us at theradiogoddess at gmail.com. Until next time, this is Prairie Miller leaving the station.